thank you uh, for the wonderful uh, and uh, elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, before I begin, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to Dr. Jamal e Khan, uh, who in fact uh, called me the other day, a couple of days back, and uh, uh, gave me this opportunity to be talking to you on a very interesting topic. Uh, I'm sure most of you, uh, uh, most of you, maybe you know, would not have uh, seen certain species in real in your life. So, we, uh, uh, based on which I'm going to be uh, talking on them, and uh, I'll be sharing some naturalist information, um, uh, which probably uh, none of you would have experienced or seen in your life. So, that is for the later part of this talk. Uh, so, I express my gratitude uh, to Dr. Jamal e Khan, the organizing committee, Dr. Nazneen, and uh, all of you who are involved in bringing me uh, to this uh, talk and share my experience. So, with this, uh, let me share the presentation. Uh, just let me know if you can see the slides. Can is, the, is my slide visible? Not put it in the slideshow mode. I'll uh, go ahead with the talk. So, sure, uh, to be talking about wildlife conservation in the Northeast India, it's going to be a, a very daunting task. Just that because um, you know the amount of information is available, uh, we'll not be able to do justice in a in an hour or in a, in a, in a ninety minute talk. So what I'm going to be doing is with a broad brush stroke, uh, I'm going to uh, give you certain uh, glimpses of uh, the biodiversity of uh, the Northeast. Now, when we talk about the Northeast, the Northeast landscape comprises, you know, you all might be knowing about, uh, it comprises of uh, various states, especially that of uh, Arunachal, Assam, uh, Manipur, Nagaland, Mizoram, Sikkim, and uh, Tripura. Uh, and we also at times include the hilly tracks of the North Bengal, uh, North Bengal districts of uh, uh, Darjeeling, places like Siliguri also, we include within the ambit of the Northeast India. And uh, this landscape can also be further, uh, you know, classified as North Bengal Duars, uh, Brahmaputra floodplains, and uh, Northeast Hill region. One interesting thing about the Northeast India is, you know, it shares uh, uh, geopolitical boundaries with uh, various countries like Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Tibet, uh, China, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. So this, uh, and also. Uh, the Northeast India is narrowly connected with the mainland India uh, through uh, a stretch, narrow strategic stretch called as the Siliguri Corridor. Now, this landscape shares about 90% of boundary with neighboring country. So, this brings a very unique geo strategic location in the country. Now, if you look at the cultural plurality, it is amazing. If you look at the biodiversity, plurality it is amazing so in terms of cultural biodiversity it's one of the you know the arguably the richest regions in uh, in the country uh, in addition to this uh, in addition to this um, uh, the, this particular landscape the entire northeast landscape uh, uh, comprising of all these uh, eight states uh, and parts of uh, the north bengal have experienced in the past several kinds of uh, habitat modification, land use, land cover change, habitat destruction. So, so there have been um, uh, ethnic conflicts, so which has resulted in shaping of, of all these, uh, you know, biodiversity or wildlife in this region. Uh, we all know about uh, extensive tea plantations that happens uh, in, in the state of Assam. Uh, this has been promoted by the colonial government, the erstwhile colonial government of uh, the, during the British era. And uh, uh, previously, there have been a lot of uh, game hunting that has happened, uh, even including charismatic species like rhinos, elephants, tigers, wild buffaloes by uh, the erstwhile colonial governments, which had led to decimation of uh, the populations of wildlife. Uh, but if you look at the uh, habitat as such, so the Northeast India, although it is predominantly uh, mountainous, the landscape is also um, it's also spread across mosaic of habitat features, uh, geographical features like you know you have uh, snow snow capped mountains in the Trans Himalayan regions, uh, you have uh, plateaus, you have valleys, you have foothills, 
uh, you have vast alluvial flood plains, flood plains of Brahmaputra. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the geography of the Northeast, uh, three major rivers of the country, um, you all know about the Brahmaputra, uh, the Tista, where it, you know, the, the, it originates from Sikkim, and which is the lifeline of Sikkim. And another major river, the Barak Basin, is also a major river. And uh, all these three rivers, tributaries, crisscross the entire uh, region of the Northeast. Uh, and this uh, shapes the uh, biological wealth, ecological wealth, cultural wealth of the Northeast. And the Northeast is, the region is also uh, high in endemism. And uh, so this landscape is an endemic bird area as well. Now, if you look at biogeographical terms and biodiversity terms, so the Northeast region has two biodiversity hotspots, the Himalaya and the Indo-Burma biodiversity hotspot. So two biodiversity, two biodiversity hotspots of the four biodiversity hotspots in the country is present in this region. And it is also located at the juncture of three biogeographic realms, the Indian realm, the Indo-Malayan realm, and the Indo-Chinese realm. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, combination of three different realms two biodiversity hotspots uh, represents diverse habitats associated with varying climate, varying uh, altitudes. And uh, this gives rise to amazing floral and faunal diversity. If you look at uh, forest types, there are Assam Valley, foothills, you know, parts of Naga Hills and Manipur Hills. There are deciduous forests. Uh, there are temperate forests in um, Shillong Plateau, Naga Hills and um, Mishmi Hills. So if you look at the fauna, faunal, faunal wealth of the region is extremely diverse. Like uh, you have uh, 13 species of primates, extremely rich in primate diversity, uh, four large cats. You have tigers, leopards, snow leopards and clouded leopards. Uh, there are uh, different bear species like uh, Asiatic bear, sloth bear, Malayan sun bear. There are canid species, uh, wild dogs and jackal. And uh, uh, so there are charismatic species like elephants, uh, gaur, one-armed rhinoceros, tiger, obviously, and wild buffalo. Now, with this background, what I'm going to do is we are going to take you and uh, we are going to go through state-wise and look at some of the important protected areas, some of the important species. And then we'll towards the end, we'll look at conservation issues for each of these states. Uh, before we further proceed, one of the major, major lifeline for the Northeast is the Brahmaputra River. So this, how does, how does this Brahmaputra influence Northeast is beyond imaginable. So, um, so this brings in a lot, uh, the Brahmaputra brings in a lot of water, obviously. In addition to the water, it brings in a lot of sediment load from the Tibetan plateau. And these sediments comes and settle down as the, as the river enters into uh, the state of Assam, it deposits a lot of sediment and soil, and this makes up the one of the largest floodplains in the world, uh, and also uh, in India. Um, so this floodplain is very rich in wildlife, and there are some important, um, um, some of the important protected areas in the, um, some of the important protected areas uh, in the country. Now Brahmaputra also acts as one of the natural barrier in the uh in the in the region natural barrier in the sense animals cannot cross from southern bank to the northern bank or vice versa from the northern bank to the southern bank species like uh hispid hare species like pygmy hog uh, uh, so species like the golden langur so these are all present on the northern side of the uh, uh river and there are also a lot of other species which cannot cross over the, ma the majestic, uh, mighty river and come down to the southern bank. Vice versa, hula gibbons at many places cannot cross over. And so this river acts as actually as a natural barrier and shapes the diversity and richness of uh, wildlife in the region. So first we'll look at uh, the state of Sikkim. Uh, so I cannot get into detail very very much in detail for this each of the state, but I'll just uh, give uh, certain very important things uh, that one needs to know and some important key uh, features of each of the state. Uh, if you look at Sikkim, a very small state uh, but uh, very rich in wildlife, uh, you have um, you have uh, a lot of protected areas. Some of them like the Rhododendron Barse uh, Sanctuary, uh, and uh, in the North Sikkim, 
the wildlife values are uh, immense. You have Kanchenjunga National Park, which is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as it has got uh, outstanding universal values in terms of uh, uh, harboring uh, several species. Uh, see, these are the important protected areas, the Kanchenjunga National Park, the Fambanglo Wildlife Sanctuary, very close to Gangtok. And some of the species that you see is black neck cranes. Uh, in fact, in the northern part of the Sikkim, the North Sikkim, uh, the black neck cranes only breeding site in the eastern Himalaya is found in this particular uh, in particular area called as the Mogutang Marshes in the North Sikkim. You have uh, red panda, very good distribution uh, of uh, red panda in the entire state of North Sikkim. You have snow leopards and uh, several plant species. One thing I would like to highlight about Sikkim Trans Himalaya. Trans Himalaya, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a separate biogeographic zone, uh, and it is found almost uh, in the northern in northern district of uh, the North Sikkim. Uh, and uh, you have uh, certain uh, important wetlands like the Guru Dongmar Lake, uh, and it is also contiguous with the Tibetan Plateau. Um, why is this particular area, a small area, a trans Himalayan region in Sikkim, why is it so important in terms of wildlife? That is because it harbors globally threatened species, like uh, four out of eight Tibetan uh, ungulates are found in this small area of maybe around, uh, maybe less than around 1,000 odd square kilometer. The, the, the Tibetan Argali, Tibetan Gazelle, you have uh, Southern Kiang, uh, you have black neck cranes, and in fact, black neck cranes breeding. Black neck crane is the only high elevation crane, high altitude crane. And uh, this is how the landscape uh, looks like. Uh, in the winters, it's completely covered with snow. And uh, in fact, we have lost, uh, the Tibetan antelope, we have lost Chiru. Chiru has become locally extinct in uh, the Trans Himalayan region of Sikkim. So, 1844, it has been documented. You can, uh, but uh, of late, we do not have Chirus there, and Chirus have become extinct. And you look at the Tibetan gazelle population, about 73% of the country's population is found in the small Trans Himalayan region of Sikkim. Tibetan Argali, about 30% of the country's population is found in uh, this region. Southern Kiang, there are only 25 individuals are present in these alpine regions. And it is different from the other subspecies of the Kiang that you fi find in the Western Himalaya. There are 100% of country's population. If you have to see the Southern Kiang, you have to go to this place in the North Sikkim. As I told, black neck cranes, the only breeding location, known breeding location in Indian part of Eastern Himalaya is in the North Sikkim. There are wintering grounds elsewhere uh, in uh, Arunachal Pradesh in the Tawang district, uh, but uh, this is the only breeding uh, ground. Very recently reported when we went for a survey, we actually recorded uh, black neck cranes breeding in this uh, Mogudang marshes. You have blue ship, you have Himalayan marmots, the Palas cat, and uh, you have uh, red foxes. There are uh, yak herders there. Who uh, who are uh, who are inhabitants of this place? Uh, of late, there have been a lot of issues pertaining to uh, there are a lot of roads that are coming into this. When roads come into a pristine area, the first impact that it brings is it brings in a lot of free ranging and feral dogs into the landscape. Once the free ranging dogs come in, we have plenty of information, scientific literature, how these free ranging dogs can impact the native wildlife, how it can impact uh, the biodiversity. So there are issues within uh, of uh, uh, there are conservation issues that comes into this landscape. Uh, I would suggest you know if if any of you are interested in trans Himalayan wildlife, especially that of Sikkim wildlife, uh, this particular paper published in uh, Oryx, though it is very old, more than a decade old, but uh, it gives Im Im immense natural history information of how uh, four of the trans Himalayan ungulates are distributed here. And uh, so it, it's a very worth reading. Uh, coming to the Assam, uh, the, one of the largest state in the Northeast, we have many national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. It has got biodiversity heritage sites. Obviously, the Brahmaputra River and the Barak River uh, flows through this. Some of the important protected areas, you have Kaziranga National Park, Manas National Park. Both of them are also tiger reserves. Nameri National Park, again, a tiger reserve. And you have Holongui Park. Gibbon Sanctuary, one of the important landscape for gibbons. In, in terms of species, you have, uh, if you look at Kaziranga, Kaziranga has got one of the highest assemblage of 
the uh, in terms of ungulates in terms of prey species for tigers you have swarm deer hawk deer you have barking deer so so you have uh, you know the plenty of uh, diversity of uh, prey species uh, you have one on rhinoceros a flagship uh, species of kaziranga for the, for the state uh, you have hula gibbons and the state uh, bird the white winged wood duck the hula gibbons are one of the only ape species that we have in the country there is no other ape species we have other apes like uh, orangutans and chimpanzees we do not have them but the only ape that we have is uh, the hula gibbons so these hula gibbons are obligate canopy dwellers they are uh, arboreal primates and uh, they are obligate canopy dwellers that means they have to be there in the canopy they don't normally they don't come down to the ground for movement from one place to other but their habitats are very gravely threatened in many areas uh, i would like to share one small study that the wi conducted in which uh, you know i was involved uh, was we are looking we were looking at we were studying how a linear intrusion uh, into a protected area uh, that is the gibbon wildlife sanctuary the hulangapar gibbon sanctuary uh, when a railway uh, there is a railway uh, track that exists and how this is impacting the hula gibbon population so this particular track of 1.6 kilometers um, dissects through the hulangipur gibbon sanctuary a small uh, sanctuary of 21 odd square kilometer so what it has done is it has bisected the uh, the uh, the protected area thereby creating a canopy vivid uh, wherein uh, on the other side on one side there are about uh, five uh, family groups and on another side there are about 20 family groups now these two have become disjunct so once they become disjunct over a period of time so this will lead to lead, lead to become a small population on either side and then when there is no genetic exchange and then they become small population isolated population and it can slowly gradually lead to local extinction in that particular area now there are also plans for expansion of this particular uh, for doubling of this track and uh, so now the canopy width is about 30 odd uh, 30 odd meters even this the uh, the gibbons find it very difficult to uh, jump over so they are to brachiate and move uh, so this is not possible now there is more uh, efforts are being to planned to expand this doubling of this track in case if the doubling is going to happen this canopy width we may increase from 30 meters to 100 odd meters now this will make it impossible for the gibbons to cross over so now wi so we have uh, uh, myself and my team so we had uh, designed this canopy bridges artificial canopy bridges wherein the uh, gibbons can try to cross over so there have been studies elsewhere there have been conservation efforts wherein uh, uh, in other gibbon species the artificial canopy bridges have been built and uh, the gibbon populations have been connected so this is an experimental way we are planning to do it so we have submitted our report we have submitted the design features and uh, so now the uh, the state government has to further take it up as an initiative and we submitted uh, this particular report considering the importance of the artificial canopy bridges in connecting the populations uh, in re very recently we also published uh, the finding of this uh, work uh, in science journal uh, we argued for uh, why rerouting of the railway is essential which can help in conserving our indian uh, gibbons so this was published in uh, uh, science and uh, we are taking forward with our recommendation trying to work with the state forest department in trying to find a long term solution for uh, conserving one of india's uh, charismatic species and one of india's only ape species that we have in our country and arunachal pradesh a very large state 80000 odd square kilometers uh, have uh, very immense biological wealth immense uh, community uh, cultural wealth uh, very interesting uh, state uh, crisscrossed by many significant rivers the kameng river the sudansiri river the one of the major tributary of brahmaputra the uh, siang river dibang river lohit so there is quite a lot of uh, uh, rivers major rivers uh, there are a lot, lot of uh, uh, protected areas at least uh, i think can think of two national parks the uh, pake uh, the the Moling National Park, Namdafa National Park. There is Tiger Reserves, three Tiger Reserves, the uh, the Kamlang Tiger Reserve, um, Namdafa Tiger Reserve, and Paki Tiger Reserve. Uh, so there are the immense uh, uh, 
uh, network of protected areas, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, key species like tigers, uh, red panda, uh, black neck cranes again, uh, and mishmi tucking. So I would like to talk about uh, very, uh, very in brief about the mishmi tuckings. Mishmi tuckings are basically a rare, uh, least known bovid species. There, this species was discovered, described uh, almost about 190 years now, and we do not have any information on this particular species. Reason being, this uh, the the habitat that the species dwells in is in a very high high elevation areas, very remote areas, and other than the local people, uh, outsiders do not know the kind of habitat where they live in, what kind of uh, food habits are there, uh, what how is the migration pattern of these species. So a lot of things we do not know. The ecological knowledge, ecological baseline of these species is really not known. So now we are conducting a project on this particular species, trying to collect uh, information on uh, uh, these uh, species. So now we have identified uh, certain congregation sites. Congregation sites are basically the areas where they come and congregate in huge numbers, more than 100 odd individuals or 200 odd individuals for a brief period of time, maybe about June to August for maybe about uh, 60 to 90 days. They come and it's a carving ground as well. So they come and uh, uh, stay in these alpine pastures, very remote areas. In order to go to those areas, congregation sites, it might take to about a week's time to 10 days time, very arduous trek and uh, very important uh, landscapes per se and very important uh, species per se. So I would like to just uh, play this video uh, of uh, that we took from our uh, camera trap image, uh, camera trap uh, video. So it, it, been, it, it lives in uh, huge herds and uh, initially when they move they when, before they come into this particular salt lake these are all salt lake these are all mineral lakes uh, rich in minerals before they come so only the subadults first couple of subadults uh, or the juveniles uh, come in and then they first scout the area and in case if they find the area to be uh, very safe for the entire herd to come in then only they will signal and then the other herds will try to uh, come and uh, only the, the adult bulls will tend to stay in the last and then the female members and juveniles tend to follow the, uh, the herd. So Takin, a very important and interesting species. Uh, we do not have much information. Of course, it is endemic to Arunachal and this particular subspecies, but there are other three subspecies. Uh, one is found in Bhutan and a couple of them are found in China. They are well studied in comparison to uh, Mishmi Takin. Um, not only that, uh, the state of Arunachal Pradesh also has high altitude tigers. We know, you know, it is not uh, like Siberian tigers. So we also have uh, tigers in our high altitude regions in very high snowing areas. And this was uh, photo captured in a community managed uh, land outside the protected area network in uh, Dibang Valley. Uh, the Bang Valley district, almost about uh, 3,600 or uh, 3,300 to 3,600 odd meters in high elevation area. Very rich in uh, wildlife again, in terms of even tigers, high altitude tigers, uh, good numbers of high altitude tigers are present in this particular area. Uh, you have uh, then coming down to Nagaland, uh, again, a lot of rivers are there, major rivers. A lot of protected areas like Intanki Wildlife Sanctuary. You have uh, tiger distribution uh, sometimes coming in to Intangi from uh, the uh, uh, from both the near Myanmar side and also from the uh, northeastern hill side. So there are it is known for uh, blight stragopan or a very uh, important pheasant species that we have, a colorful bird and very Im immense. Uh, we all know about the conservation success story of. Amur falcons, Amur falcon, uh, a long migratory bird which traverses from the northern uh, North China uh, to South Africa uh, and through it goes through several countries and India is one of the major, major uh, stopover sites for the Amur falcons. Earlier it was heavily poached and heavily hunted and heavily trapped but uh, due to conservation interventions and conservation actions, uh, the local communities are now in fact protecting these birds and they, they take extreme pride in conserving the Amur falcons. So Amur falcons in the last uh, few years have been one of the major conservation success story. And this was highlighted by one of the finest uh, naturalist uh, 
um, Ramki, and um, it, it was through his effort this particular bird received such huge conservation attention, and uh, it has been very successful as well. So coming on to Manipur and a very important state, a small state in in the northeast, uh, but very rich in uh, wildlife. Uh, you have uh, national parks like the Kaibulamjau National Park in the Loktak Lake. Loktak Lake is a uh, is a Ramsar site, uh, wetland of international importance, uh, and the southeast portion of this particular lake harbors the uh, small protected area of 40 square kilometers of uh, the Kaibulamjau National Park, which has the only known existing wild population within India for the Manipur blue antler deer or the dancing deer. They live in this fumdis, the thick vegetation, floating mass of vegetation, and it is also called as the floating national park. A very important uh, species, and also the siroi lily, which is endemic to the Manipur uh, the hills of uh, Churachandpur and the Ukrul district, and it, uh, it it flowers very very during the flowering season is very limited to uh, the months of fifteenth uh, of May to maybe thirtieth uh, of June. Within just thirty to forty five days, the uh, blooming happens for this siroi lily flower. Uh, and uh, very distinct uh, uh, flower, floral uh, species for Manipur and also for the country. You have uh, and then uh, the swamp deers. Meghalaya, again, a uh, very important uh, uh, state for a uh, lot of uh, important wildlife. In fact, uh, the cave caves of, uh, I think, um, uh, students from Aligarh Muslim University have gone and uh, described a certain species from uh, uh, the caves of uh, Meghalaya. Uh, so I think you would be aware about how immense the wealth of uh, uh, caves for sustaining many wildlife species. Uh, so you have Balpakram National Park, you have Nokrek uh, National Park, hornbills are very rich. Nepenthes cassiana, a very important uh, pitcher plant, the Meghalaya pitcher plant, which is a very interesting species. Uh, you have uh, clouded leopards, you have uh, elephants coming into Meghalaya also uh, are some of the important species. In terms of Mizoram, Mizoram again uh, adjoining uh, between Tripura and between uh, uh, Manipur, sandwiched between these two states, has two two important protected areas. One is the Dampa Tiger Reserve and the Merlin uh, National Park. So you have uh, tigers in Dampa, but uh, the numbers have gone down, uh, gone down, and uh, there are species like the Himalayan uh, Cerro, uh, the Red Wanda, the Epiphyte are distributed there. In terms of Tripura, Tripura again. Uh, uh, quite a lot of species are there. The important species for Tripura is, uh, in terms of primate, it's the spectacled uh, macaque, uh, the uh, spectacled uh, the, the monkey, which is the Firis uh, langur, uh, which is an endangered species. Uh, you have, uh, um, and you have a couple of protected areas like Sapajila Wildlife Sanctuary and Gumti Wildlife Sanctuary. There is a good population of gore, a good population of uh, clouded leopard. It also shares transboundary uh, transboundary borders with that of Bangladesh. And in the North Bengal region, you have uh, species like uh, uh, leopards, uh, you have uh, elephants. Elephants are in heavy, con severe conflict. Uh, there are a lot of deaths also happens in the railway tracks, uh, and also crop depredation problems are there. There are red panda there in the North Bengal, in uh, Gurumara National Park, and Mahananda Wildlife Sanctuary, Sapajila. Uh, one on rhinoceros are there, Bengal tigers are there, and one of the most important uh, amphibians, that is the Himalayan salamander, the Tylotritron himalayansis. So this, uh, uh, why is it important is, obviously it is in the in, present in the wetlands. One important thing taxonomically is, it represents one order called as the Caudata, and this is the only representative of uh, this one family, one genus, and one species, which is the Tylotritron himalayensis. So this is a very important species. If you look at uh, conservation issues, there are several conservation issues like uh, like uh, habitat loss. You have deforestation, urbanization, infrastructure development. Uh, I, I spoke to you about for one species, how linear intrusion can impact uh, the habitat behavior uh, of uh, the gibbons with the case study. So there are also a lot of uh, new initiatives like uh, expansion for palm oil cultivation, which can have an effect on wildlife species. Like we had, we have a uh, uh, very well known example of how palm oil cultivation in Southeast Asia has decimated populations of orangutans. So there are cases of poaching still happening in certain uh, states, which needs to be tackled. Uh, so the, if you look at the path ahead, we look, we'll have to enhance 
the protected area network maybe we can think of uh, think of uh, coming out with new ideas like uh, having more community conserved conserved areas because these areas are all mostly community owned and in fact uh, many places uh, they do a good job by protecting uh, the local species so there are um, in iucn also tries to uh, promote certain categories like the oecms other effective area based conservation measures the community conserved areas oecms um, so all these things can have a very important uh, uh, impact long lasting impacts so involving the communities in conservation identifying uh, areas promoting tourism and local communities benefiting through those uh, uh, ecotourism initiatives can be the path ahead and uh, of course we need to have a lot of awareness and education for species there are species like white bellied heron so there are very few in numbers and they are found in the uh, rivers of lohit river and noadhing so which needs to be protected in, in india we have less than 10 individuals coming so we need to protect them and uh, effort should be made to create awareness and educate about the importance of such species and conserving the species can have in, the, in fact uh, can serve as flagships and uh, save the rivers where they are there of course there are a lot of research and monitoring needs to happen there are a lot of species that are getting described uh, re rediscovered discovered especially the lower taxa like amphibians and herpetofauna uh, species are get, even uh, primate species uh, higher vertebrates are also getting described and discovered so there are a lot of uh, research priorities needs to be set in so that uh, uh, ecological baselines uh, for most important species are lacking here so which can be enriched and we also have to engage with public campaigns to and involve garner more uh, political support for conservation of the uh, such very rich wildlife species in the northeast so with this i would like to thank uh, take time to thank my students so most of the work that i have been doing is uh, you know with their effort i would like to read out their names uh, please you know patiently hear me out so gaurav aishu uh, kushiali avinash rohitja arif divya deepan siddharth Udayraj, Sumit, and Geetima. So some of them, most of them are my PhD students and some of them are my master's student. And uh, so I would also like to thank many of my numerous friends and family from Northeast. Without their help, local families, without their help, we will not be able to do uh, work in the Northeast. We have many field collaborators. I would like to thank them, all the forest departments, and uh, my director, uh, dean and register for permitting me to, you know, interacting with you all. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you all of you, and uh, I'll be glad to take uh, questions from you. Thank you very much, respected sir, for your very informative and enriching talk on biodiversity conservation in Northeast India. There are questions from participants, and I and Mr. Anas will read out those questions one, one by one. The first question is from Priya Singh Kushwaha from Botanical Survey of India. She wants to know more about the Mishmi Taken. Pardon? Mishmi Taken, is it? Taken, yeah, she wants huh? to know about that. Yeah, Mishmi Taken is a, it's a bovid, uh, it's, a, it's a goat antelope and uh, it's a very rarely known species as i said uh, several hundreds uh, about more than about close to two centuries the species has been described but we do not have much information on it yeah in fact local people the traditional knowledge on the species is amazing so uh, so when we go and try to assess what is the population where they are distributed so we cannot do uh, much justice to to them uh, to, to you know uh, so we need to collaborate with the local communities and through their traditional knowledge we have been we have been uh, successful in identifying many areas the congregation sites without their help we will not have been able to uh, attempt to identify so so yeah we have been enriching uh, some basic information on the species we also have plans to collar them uh, fit transmitters uh, satellite collars so that this has a transboundary movement from the tibetan plateau it comes into uh, you know, it has a very high uh, uh, elevational range. It can come from as below as 700 meters and then go up to 4,500 4, meters. So it has a very 
a seasonal movement pattern. This has been uh, quite a well documented in the other uh, talking subspecies, but not in this. So we are trying to enrich uh, more information on their migratory pattern, their ecological uh, ecological uh, patterns like uh, food habits and uh, trying to assess important congregation sites. So our main aim is to identify key species within Arunachal Pradesh. So we want to identify uh, at least if you can identify congregation sites across Arunachal Pradesh, that itself is a very, which will yield amazing information. Yeah. Thank you. Any other next question, please? Thank you, sir. The next question is how critical is the current state of biodiversity in Northeast India? Mm -hmm. And what are the primary threats of wildlife conservation in this region? Uh, in the Northeast, uh, you know, wildlife is very rich. As I said, it's arguably one of the very richest region in the uh, country. So there are different species. So different species comes with different threat levels. Different species comes with resilience. Different uh, species, you know, has some kind of resilience to the threats. So we cannot just say that, you know, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, there are several kinds. Like for example, you take one species like hula gibbons. So for hula gibbons, loss of habitat, loss of canopy, uh, habitat destruction, uh, habitat modification, uh, conversion of uh, primary forest into tea plantations. So these all can be one you know kind of threat levels. So you take uh, white-bellied heron. White-bellied heron, one of the major threat can be construction of hydroelectric power projects. If you change the flow, this species is a it lives in fast-flowing rivers, undisturbed, unhindered flow has to be there. So. So there are different kinds of threat levels to different species. So maybe we cannot give a single prescription, but uh, yeah, so uh, there are land use, land cover change uh, can be one threat. Climate change obviously can be a threat to several species. Uh, infrastructure development uh, can can also linear intrusions. So so all these things can affect different species differently. Um, so, but otherwise, uh, in terms of wildlife, Northeast is doing great and uh, it's one of the richest region for wildlife so the next question is from Debussy's jane he are, is asking what are some of the conservation measures undertaken by wildlife institute of india for the conservation of one horn rhino in assam so we wi works with uh, there is a program called as the roadies and uh, wi has a very um, uh, for a long time, we are trying to help in trying to estimate the population numbers. And uh, we also collaborate with the state government and we uh, offer uh, whatever expertise is needed in terms of wildlife health and also in terms of population monitoring. Uh, so while uh, Wildlife Institute tends to give uh, technical and knowledge uh, inputs for uh, whenever the state government seeks our inputs. Sir, the next question is, what is the role of gene banks in biodiversity conservation? Uh, it's a very broad question, but yeah, gene, gene, you, you see, when we talk about biodiversity conservation, one of the most important thing is, yeah, species diversity and maintaining uh, other diversity is good, but the most important thing is maintaining and managing the genetic diversity. So this gene, uh, you know, for having this gene, gene pool and genetic diversity is very, very interesting. So like, for example, I spoke to you about the high altitude tour, the high altitude, uh, high altitude tigers. So these high altitude tigers are genetically very unique. So compared to the other tigers, uh, other uh, population of tigers that we have in the country. So in terms of uh, even uh, gibbons, gibbons are also, uh, you know, there are uh, four different populations, the northern population, southern population. So there are within the state of, uh, uh, within the upper range of Kula Gibbons within the country. So maintaining this genetic diversity is very, very crucial. Like for example, the Manipur Bro Antledia, a small population, uh, highly heavily inbred. Um, and then when there is more inbreeding, there is more uh, heterozygosity is very less. So then uh, there, there is uh, deformities in uh, in uh, their antlers and deformities in and then uh, their fitness, their uh, uh, reduction in their fitness levels. So so there are efforts to increase their genetic fitness by having uh, having a second population so that uh, so the genetic diversity is very high yeah so yeah 
Sir, the next question is from Tanisha Dagur. She's saying, as seen in a recent report titled State of Indian Birds, SOIB, it was observed there was deficient data regarding the status of birds in eastern areas like Manipur, etc. What's your take on the citizen science initiatives and research studies on avifaunal diversity in East? So there are, uh, obviously, when we look at uh, the eBird data, so you will have more uh, uh, sightings, uh, more observations being recorded from southern Indian states like uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu. So, so there are a lot of more people there, and uh, uh, so there are people uh, uploading more lists. It also to relation into in terms of uh, people are very interested in the northeast. So, in terms of population, I think uh, probably. Uh, we have uh, in other areas there are more population and people are loading more lists and more observation. So not only that, I think it is picking up and people are also now uh, uploading a lot of information and uploading lists. Obviously, in the next few years, uh, we'll get more uh, information, more lists, more observation on many species. Uh, like, for example, you are saying about Manipur and uh, other uh, states of uh, the Northeast. So there are a lot of uh, very important uh, bird areas within uh, in the, within the state, important species uh, like Scleders monal, you have uh, black neck cranes, you have blight stagopan, you have uh, immense wealth of birds in uh, in the northeast. A lot of hornbills, uh, very important uh, in terms of seed dispersals. Uh, so they are very unique, and so I think over the period of time in coming years, I think there will be more observations recorded from northeast, which is being recorded. Like for example, areas like the Mishmi Hills are very important in terms of bird in terms of bird diversity. So, yeah. You need to give time, and uh, I think uh, as time progresses, uh, more information will come out. Sir, the next question is: Is given a keystone species? Pardon? Is given a keystone species? Uh, like for example, yes, obviously, you know, I can consider them as a keystone species. Keystone species, in the sense, you remove the species, and uh, they can. Uh, the entire thing can collapse. In terms of uh, if it is there in a particular habitat, this being a frugivore, uh, so uh, it has to uh, feed on uh, uh, fruits and then it uh, disperses the uh, it disperses uh, the trees. So it, it it can be considered as a keystone species actually, because otherwise, if gibbons are there, not there, so there might be other primates um, like uh, stumptail macaque and other species are there. So we may consider them as uh, keystone species. But uh, in terms of like, uh, if, you, if you ask me if the entire thing will collapse, uh, which is doubtful, but yeah, we may consider them as uh, uh, it's a flagship species. So the next question is from jo Dr. Jogendra Singh. He has queries regarding wildlife ecology and environment. He wants to know how to correlate each other or to understand the environmental conservation with wildlife ecology or environment or separately. Mm. So it's all it's all the same, like you know. So uh, environment, uh, ecology, wildlife. Like for example, these are all uh, like um, when you talk about uh, uh, ecology, you talk about uh, you know the status and distribution of species and how these are shaped by environmental variables so, so everything is linked it's not just you know one is it is all linked with each other so the environmental variables influences how a species uh, gets uh, uh, distributed and how its populations are controlled or so it could be various limiting factors you know so these are all i think uh, basic uh, information that one we have would all have studied so yeah the, to uh, cut it short uh, it's all all of them are linked up Sir, the next question is from Sayeda Alina Khan. She is asking, what role does technology play in monitoring and safeguarding wildlife in Northeast India? And are there any innovative approaches being implemented? There are uh, several. Uh, one thing is normally that what we do is trying to estimate the population is by we are using camera traps. So this is one, which is basic. So there are a lot of issues like now there are a lot of conflict issues in terms of elephant conflict issues. So these elephant conflict issues, especially in North Bengal in Assam, so especially in uh, where uh, uh, where uh, railway railways passes through. So there are technologies of uh, laying of optical fibers and trying trying to look at 
using their uh, you know when uh, elephants walk so somehow if this signal can be embedded into the signal of the railways so if this can be communicated if if if, uh, if the elephants are ahead in the railway track and uh, if somehow this signal can be transferred to the uh, locomotive driver so so this can be uh, the elephant uh, so the train speed can be controlled and the elephant mortalities can be reduced so these are the technologies that, that are being they are, you know wa is also involved with this we are working with uh, uh, ministry of railways and other uh, signal maintenance uh, agencies and optical fiber engineers to look at solutions to uh, minimize conflict not only this there are also other uh, conflict mitigation mechanisms like like uh, hanging solar panels for preventing elephants to entering into human habitations or the crop fields so there are very different uh, different uh, technologies that are being used uh, the uavs the unmanned aerial vehicles are also used for surveying uh, for many areas uh, so there are a lot of being technologies that are being used uh, in terms of uh, various purposes in, the, in our field of wildlife conservation and management. So the last question from Mr. Debasis again. What should be the measures taken for conservation of wildlife resources from the yearly devastated floods of Brahmaputra River? Brahmaputra is the, uh, the flow of Brahmaputra is the annual rhythm. It actually is not, it is not at all a negative thing uh, for the Northeast. It brings in more water and sediment, as I said. It shapes the entire landscape. Only thing is our populations have increased and we have settled uh, in on most of the places and this flooding happens. Like for example, without flooding, Kaziranga National Park or Tiger Reserve cannot exist. So flooding is a very important mechanism for survival of uh, Kaziranga. Uh, the floodwaters from uh, from uh, the Brahmaputra it reaches into uh, Kaziranga, it swells up, and then uh, the waters then recedes back into Brahmaputra. So this gives brings in a lot of uh, sediments, and then uh, gives a lot of life to the uh, uh, floral wealth of uh, uh, which also you know like for example uh, the one on rhinoceros may, may may require long grasses. And then hog deer, smaller uh, ungulate species may require short grasses. So this kind of balances, uh, you know, the, sh the the river actually shapes the biological wealth of the uh, the landscape. The Debrugad, the Debru, the Debru Saikova National Park in uh, which which is found in the confluence of the rivers of Lohit, Dibang, and Siang is again a very important protected area. So waters, floodwaters coming in shapes the uh, ecological design uh, of uh, these uh, landscapes. It's very important. Thank there are too many questions. Much, Thank you very much, respected sir, for answering the questions. We are extremely grateful to you for sparing your precious time for delivering the talk. We wish you and your family a happy, healthy, productive, and joyful long life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, all of you. And I would uh, love to uh, you know, hear the feedback uh, from the participants. If you can share it, it will be nice. And thanks to the organizing committee. And uh, thanks, Nazneen. And uh, thanks to Dr. Jamal Khan. Thank you so much.